Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old-fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 157 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO, Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for this interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, I'm joined by a pair of agave warriors, pyromaniac distilling engineer Salvador Petiban, a.k.a. Chava, and Lou Bank, founder of Sacred, a U.S.-based agave nonprofit organization. They're the hosts of the hit podcast Agave Road Trip, which debuted earlier this summer on Heritage Radio Network. And in this interview, we put all our pinas on the table talking about mezcal, direct fire distillation, and the wild, wonderful world of agave. But before we break out the copitas and start sipping, let's take a quick pit stop on the cocktail side of things and give you the chance to make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Esplanade Swizzle, and I love this drink for a couple reasons. First, it was developed by Chicago bartender Danny Shapiro, and we have a great Chicago connection in this episode with Lou Bank, who calls Chi-Town his home when he's not journeying around Oaxaca. Second, it's got a Montiato sherry, which is arguably my favorite style of sherry, lightly oxidized, nutty, and complex, just like me. To make the Esplanade Swizzle, you'll need one ounce of mezcal, one ounce of Amontillado sherry, three quarters of an ounce of lime juice, a half an ounce of falernum, and one half ounce of ginger syrup. We've got a great product courtesy of Pratt Standard available on our e-commerce store if you need a great ginger syrup. To make it, you'll just fill a highball glass halfway with crushed or pebble ice, add your ingredients, Give them a good, healthy jostle with a swizzle stick, and then top with more crushed ice. Garnish with a freshly activated sprig of mint and enjoy. Swizzles are a great way to embrace the summer heat. The crushed ice and falernum give the Esplanade Swizzle a distinct tiki vibe, while the ginger syrup and the Amontillado sherry offer some rich, spicy notes to complement the mezcal. So, now that you've got yourself a tall glass of cool, silky deliciousness to keep you company, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this South of the Border discussion with Lou Bank and Chava Periban, hosts of Agave Road Trip, some of the topics we discuss include how Chava and Lou came to fall in love with Mezcal, each in their own special way. Lou by way of beer, and Chava, well, let's just say his journey may have involved a little underage drinking and something called Aguas Locas, a.k.a. Crazy Waters. What makes agave spirits so special, including milling, direct fire distillation, earthen oven roasting, and a terroir unique from any other in the world? Of course, we talk about agave road trip, but more importantly, we try to capture some of the stories, flavors, and a few examples of the 400 decisions, and that's not a random number, that mezcaleros must make as they cultivate, ferment, and distill their products. There's a few other important discussions that anchor this interview. One is the recap of an agave tasting seminar that Lou gave at Tales of the Cocktail in 2019, where he walked people through a 3 by 3 comparative tasting that demonstrated the fingerprints of the agave varietal versus the fingerprint of the mezcalero versus the fingerprint of the moment, or the batch, or the microbiome. Another is our attempt at explaining the very tricky line that external interests must walk when interacting with the Mezcal community. This is a question I've been stewing on since I met Lou a year ago, and I think we uncover some really important questions that all gringos need to consider when we make choices about Mezcal. And finally, we do a little thought experiment to figure out what the world might look like if agave spirits were produced in places outside of Mexico. Between Chava's intimate understanding of the engineering and production sides of agave spirits and Lou's experience running a nonprofit that addresses food and water insecurity in the communities responsible for these incredible products, you're in for a real treat here. 
You get a real sense of the humor and passion that underpin the Agave Road Trip podcast, which you can download for free on all your favorite podcasting platforms. And you can also support them by heading to heritageradionetwork.com, clicking on the beating heart at the top of the screen, and selecting Agave Road Trip as the beneficiary of your donation. With that, I'm pleased to present this really fun conversation with Chava Pettiban and Lou Bank of Agave Road Trip. Lou and Chava, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we feel flattered and happy. Hola. <laughs> hola, hola. Yes, so we're going to be talking about, uh, of course, your podcast, The Gave Road Trip. And uh, I, before we get there, can you just both introduce yourselves and tell our listeners who you are and what you do? Go, Lou. You go first, Chava. Well, no, you go first. No you, go first. <laughs> no, you go first. No, you go first. Okay, I'll do it first, Lou. You don't need to get aggressive and all. My name is <laughs> Salvador Perivan, Chava Perivan. Uh, I, I'm from Mexico. I was born in Michoacan, but have lived almost all my life in Mexico City. And I've done plenty of things around artisanal products, craft, be it glass blowing, ceramics. And now I happen to be stuck in delightful agave spirits. <laughs> It's your turn, and, Lou. <laughs> okay, fine. And I'm Lou Bank, and you know I've been running nonprofits since roughly 2000, 2001. Um, and I I started drinking agave spirits back in 2005, and it was really it was like something I really enjoyed drinking. But uh, once I went down to Mexico to Oaxaca specifically in 2008 to see where they were made, it became a much bigger deal to me and and I saw the opportunity to um, to bring what I bring to the nonprofit world uh, in the rest of the world in Chicago uh, to to bring that down to Mexico yeah yeah and um, you know Lou my my first uh, I guess encounter with you your story and your passion was uh, I, it seems like longer than a year ago, but uh, it was it was, <laughs> la- it was last year around this time at Tales of the Cocktail where uh, you were able to share this really cool comparative tasting that uh, sort of walked people not only through your journey with meeting and experiencing the products from different producers, but also sort of your mindset and how your perceptions have evolved as you've made your way through the world of agave spirit. So I'd, I'd love, maybe let's start with Chava uh, <laughs> and uh, have Chava walk us through his experience uh, growing to love agave spirits as someone who lives and works in Mexico. And then maybe we can kind of contrast that with uh, how you and Chava came to work together and how you came to really become deeply involved with not only the products, but also the people. So Chava, why don't you kick us off? Well, as you know, in Mexico, underage drinking is quite a thing. So we all start drinking <laughs> from like at 14, 13. It's like when you start getting your first drinks. And of course, you start with horrible things, right? I'm not going to name any brands, but you start with the tequilas that are not very expensive and that go well with soda. So that's the first last five years of your life. But then happily... <laughs> uh, wait, 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 wait. The first, the first five years? So like from birth to age five? <laughs> no, like 13 to 18. Oh, and then, okay. And, and then, like, when you reach 18, you're like, I'm doing something wrong. This cannot be it. Like, there has to be <laughs> something bigger and better out there. So, happily, right then, people were starting to mention the word mezcal around you. And before that, uh, there's this thing called tonayan, which is actually not even mezcal. It's just something that inflation has not touched in Mexico. So, you know, when I was a kid, you'll buy, like, uh, chips for two, 2.5 pesos. Right? Like a bag of chips cost that. And Tonayan was like 19 pesos. Tonayan is still today 19 pesos. And the chips are up to like 7 pesos. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Hang on a second. You've you've never mentioned this to me before, Chava. So Tonayan, you said? Yes. So it's. Is this. Is it an agave spirit? Well, I I read the label the other day. It's 25 ABB. It's a combination, a nice blend of sugar cane, uh, some sort of agave spirit. And a lot of additives and flavor and added flavors. It's very famous to do something that is called aguas locas, so crazy waters. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you know that that was sort of uh, what we had around. And but then happily, the world started changing, bars started changing. Uh, so when I was 18, I was allowed to legally enter bars. There was this jazz place called El Cinco, 
which is an amazing jazz place if you ever come to Mexico City. And they, they had this mezcal called Tierra de Almas with a really nice label, like handmade paper label. And I tried that. Completely blew my mind. But I didn't find it again for many years until I moved to Oaxaca. And I, I studied industrial design. So I moved to Oaxaca because if you want to do a PhD in materials and techniques and you don't want to pay like, I don't know, New York fees, go to Oaxaca for eight years, work with artisans, and there you have it. So I started working with ceramics, glass blowing, uh, and I was specializing in fire, combustion systems. Uh, so I was making- It's funny, I, between the ages of 13 and 18, I specialized in fire. So I was, I was ahead of you, Chava. <laughs> You're always ahead of me, Lou, but don't show off. It's my time to talk. It's my time to shine, Lou. Fair, 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 sorry. So anyways, I was doing that. And eventually, as you say, as, as you all guys know, one of the most specialized, I will say specialized just because it's so unique to mezcal or agave spirits, it's his destillation technologies. So it's one of the few spirits in the planet where they still use direct fire to distill it. Not all of it, but a good chunk of it, the, the best things for my palate. So uh, these brands started approaching us because they were scaling, but they had this big problem. They could just not buy tequila equipment because it was all steam based. It's like, we don't know anybody developing distillation equipment with direct fire for a mezcal. Can you guys develop that? So we actually got some government scientific grants to do that. And we started developing these kilns for a couple brands. And I ended up developing this for Sombra Mezcal at some point. And uh, when we installed it, everybody was like, yeah, it's super cool. But they were terrified to use this. So John, <laughs> who runs this, the Palenque, was like, well, if they see a kid like you, like skinny, crazy hair kid using this, they're so macho, they're going to be like, I can use this for sure. So that was my job for for a but, while. <laughs> but you know, actually, I'm, hang on, the, like, you've actually just clarified something for me. I think I thought that Sombra was using a steam jacket. No, never. For, Are you kidding me? No, absolutely. I not. I would never kid you, Chava. That's heresy. No, 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 no steam oh. jackets in Sombra under no circumstances. But didn't you design like the whole still in a way that the heat was surrounding the entire like the, the whole pot of the still? Yeah, well, that's the genius part of what we used to do. It's we're trying to replicate what happens with having coals, like, you know, like just the wood coals that mm -hmm. surround the, uh, the, the steel very gently instead of uh, just like a crazy amount of fire touching the steel because you burn everything, you have crazy, like flavors are off, your cuts are all off because your lower part, it's super, like you have a lot of problems. So we that was the that, that was the real complex part to design. How can you do a direct fire system that is very gentle and can create a very gentle distillation? So that's God, that's that, my uh, that's my background in agave spirits. Oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> well, look at that. We're we're doing your podcast, Eric, and learning stuff that I didn't know about agave spirits. That's the beauty of agave spirits. Yeah, I love it, and I love the sort of I I love what both of you bring to the podcast and we'll get back to that when we talk a little bit about agave road trip but yeah we've just I, I, I we've just discovered an agave spirit that lou did not know about which is if you if you asked me to come up with something that would happen on this podcast that probably wasn't going to be on the list uh, and and we're talking about uh emulating a steam jacket or emulating some characteristics of a steam jacket using direct fire stills and you know uh, chava's design genius Genius. So uh, I, we're already off to a rock and start here. Um, Lou, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your journey through agave and kind of how you think uh, about these spirits and how you're maybe how you're thinking about them has changed over time? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I started a distillery back in 2002, one of the first 50 craft distilleries in the U.S. Um, I was working at, at Rogue Ales um, in Portland, Oregon. And, uh, and they decided, and I was in marketing, but they decided that it was marketing to start a distillery. So it was my job to go to the, then the BATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and get, get legal approval to do it. And then once I did that, they said, okay, now it's your job to make rum. Nothing I'd ever done. Um, so I worked with another guy and we figured out how to make, uh, 
perfectly inadequate rum. But in essence, I learned the distillation process or so I thought, right? <laughs> so, so I also learned to fall in love with beer while I was working for Rogue. Before I'd had that job, I'd had maybe five glasses of beer, maybe. And I, I just thought all beer tasted like Coors. And then I was able to taste this beautiful micro brew and it got me all excited. And then I fell in love with beer and then I found out I was gluten intolerant. And then I had to find uh, a new, a new thing to drink. Um, and that's how I, I wound up at, uh, at Mescal. But that honestly, for me, that was, I mean, I like it and I liked it, but it's not something that I was obsessed with. I had to, I had to, my wife and I had to leave, um, Chicago for a couple of weeks um, in order to, we were having some movers move our house. Our dog had just died. We didn't want to have to box everything up around these big fluffs of fur. Um, so, so we just thought, let's get out of town and have movers do it. And we'll show up, come back home, show up at the new place. So where are we going to go? Um, and it was almost Dia de los Muertos and it felt like, you know, to honor the dog's life, that's sort of a thing. And my little sister had been to Oaxaca and told me I would love it. And there was the mezcal and Connie, um, uh, <laughs> still swears to me she isn't fluent in Spanish, but she absolutely was on that trip because um, she she did a semester in Spain in school. She's great in um, Spanish, Lou. Do not undermine Connie's ability in Spanish. No, no, no. I'm doing the opposite. She tells me that no, she's no, not fluent. No. I like every time we get into a trouble, and I, you know, you know me, Chava. I get into a lot of trouble. Anytime we get into trouble in Mexico, and Connie's with me, she gets me out of the trouble. She does, but it's just because she looks so sweet, Lou. It's nothing she says. She just looks at you with those huge, massive eyes. And okay, just you got to decide <laughs> which one it is, Chava. Does, <laughs> is it is it she's fluent in Spanish or does she have big, big eyes? Which one is it? Beautiful big eyes. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so we decide, okay, let's go spend, you know, a couple weeks down in Oaxaca. And we're down there and I'm having fun drinking stuff. Um, and, and one evening... We're at Los Danzantes, this restaurant in Centro, and the the waiter asked me what I sh you know what do I want to drink, and I ask him what I should drink, and he serves me this amazing mezcal, and then tells me you know tomorrow there's this little uh, this organic market just a couple blocks from here, and the guy who makes this Don Lorenzo will be at that market. You should go. You should meet him, and I did. And there were only a couple days left in our trip and we had stuff planned, but after buying a, like a dozen bottles from Don Lorenzo, uh, he, he invited us to come and visit his Palenque where he makes the spirit. And, and I wanted to, but we had no time. And I said that to him and he said, ah, it's okay when you come back next year. And, and literally <laughs> had he not said, when you come back next year, I don't think I would have gone back. I don't, wow. but I like, it was, it was that very kind invitation. And this is. This is really part of what I love about about Mexico, specifically rural Mexico, is this this just this really deep sense of hospitality. So mm -hmm. he he invited me back, and I felt like I had to go back. Mm -hmm. So I went back and, and and made arrangements with him by email ahead of time, and, and literally confirmed it like three days ahead of time. And I show up at his house, and he'd forgotten we were going to be there, <laughs> <laughs> which is also very much like. <laughs> rural Mexico. Um, but his son, Eduardo Andales, uh, s s wandered in, saw us, asked what we were doing, and said he'd take us on the tour. And, you know, at, at that point, I toured enough distilleries that I knew how it ran. 45 minutes of walk and talk, 15 minutes of drinking. I thought that's what we were in for. Eight hours later, I realized this was a whole different world. Looking at the stills, I couldn't figure, again, I had this background. I distilled. I knew what distillation looked like. And I'm looking at what he's got, and it doesn't look like a still. It looks like a like a brick pizza oven with a backyard clay chimney dropped into the center. And I'm trying to figure out how the hell did this guy come up with this process? And that, that started my journey of trying to figure figure this out and it's you know it's like so many things the the complexity of it is actually a very simple thing and the simple thing is just there are these families that never adopted the industrialized methods that changed the world and and my quest was why did they not do and i didn't realize this but my quest was why did they not adopt these methods and and 
then trying to figure out why is this so important in the context of human progress? And that's, I mean, it's, it's a much, it's much longer. It's, it's a longer thing to discuss. And I already feel like I've taken more than my share of time. But, you know, I really do think like what, what I'm trying to do with sacred is not only preserve, eh, I shouldn't say preserve, is yeah. not only help these families to continue doing what they're doing the way they're doing it, which is kind of arrogant because, hey, they've been doing it for 400, 500 years. Do they really need me? Um, but then also to bring their voices to the larger public, because I think, I think they have some really good ideas to contribute to the conversations around water insecurity and food insecurity and climate change. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what got me, that's what got me excited. Yeah, I, I think that's a, an incredible way to sum it up. Uh, and, and you're right, you know, it's it's very difficult for us gringos to walk the walk the right line in these situations where, you know, we're we're so passionate and we're so excited about the spirits that are coming out of Mexico and some of the uh, amazing production methods and the people responsible for them. But, you know, I think we, we will return to, you know, uh, <laughs> how we negotiate that tricky uh, balance <laughs> between doing doing right versus uh, being being intrusive. Let's talk a little bit for our listeners who might not be so familiar with agave spirits with some of the things that make them special and different. Uh, we've already talked about the fact that the stills and the distillation process is very different. But I wonder, Chava, you and you and I actually went back and forth a little bit via email before we jumped on this call. Can, can you talk about some of the things that, that you really enjoy about agave spirits from perhaps a... Uh, um, a process or uh, an agave varietal perspective? Yeah, like I, I think it's really interesting because a lot of people try to compare agave spirits to spirits, right? They'll compare it immediately mm -hmm. like to the whiskeys, the vodkas, the bourbons. And what I found that uh, it's sort of, I, I guess, more atypical is that I, I find more similarities with other fermented drinks. And because mm -hmm. I, I think one of the, I mean, as much as we talk so much about distillation, I think a lot, and this is an ongoing fight I have with Lou, uh, how, how important is debate. each part? Yeah, fight. It's a debate, not it's a fight, a fight. Chava. <laughs> uh, it's, I think fermentation, it's one of the parts that makes it truly unique. And I was listening to a lot of the episodes of, of your podcast, and you have this amazing interview with, uh, with a sake expert. I cannot recall her name, but she was awesome. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about koji. And in agave, you have a similar thing where the sugars are in, embedded in the, in the agave itself. They're not usable right off the bat. You have to find a way to break those long sugar chains and use them. But something that absolutely blew my mind with the koji similarity is like she was saying, you will use different kojis to have different profiles of fermentation. So certain kojis will allow for a longer fermentation and more bolder flavors, and others will allow for a colder fermentation with more subtle flavors. What, what that made me think, and again, like every time I say these kind of things, I really hope there's a PhD student in chemistry listening to me, <laughs> and I'm going to force them to do their studies about this. But uh, we had this conversation, Lou and I, about that milling the agave. How milled do you want it to be, right? Because if you go into a palenque, you've seen like the taona, you hit, you've been seeing hand milled, you use wood chippers, and they all come, they all produce different textures of milled agave. So one of our big questions, like, why do you want different textures? What, what, what effect do they have? And I'm starting to think that it's the same effect as choosing different coaches, depending how thin the meal is or how, like, how, how much do you meal it, it's going to be easier for the yeasts to get to all the sugars, therefore fermenting faster. The bigger mm -hmm. the chunk is, the harder it's going to get for the yeasts to get in there and probably just making the fermentation longer. So this you is know, all but, speculation, but, uh, but, but you know, it's like, it, it's a kind of stuff that blows my mind. <laughs> but you know, but I, I also think it's not, it's not solely uh, how long it takes to ferment. I think it's literally how many of the sugars do get fermented, right? Yeah. Like this is, this is where you hear, when you hear somebody like, uh, like Zygnum talking about their diffuser method of, um, of making mezcal, 
they talk about getting, I think it's like 99.8% of the sugars out of the agave. And and I think a lot of that has to do with exactly what you're talking about, Chava, with that milling. And so if you're not milling it to that super fine level, some sugars just never turn into alcohol. Yep. Uh, and again, like really please PhD students of the world, listen to do <laughs> and, and study this because that's the other thing too. And, you know, with cognac, brandy, a lot of all a lot of the other spirits that are out there, you have hundreds of years of research being made. So a lot of the dynamics that bring certain flavors to be more prevalent or not is very well understood. In the agave spirits, the research, it's tiny, it's minuscule. Like even the tequila, which is a larger economic force, you don't find a lot of papers out there that really explain the effects of the different decisions. So it like just to answer in a broader way your question is how they're similar, how it's different. I think one of the things that is most important is we don't really know to this date how different they are because we don't have information. We know it comes from agave, which is the weirdest thing you can make alcohol if you ask me. Like grapes, grains, come on. That's been around forever. Those are like, you know, it made a lot of sense. Honey, like they were there and it just made a lot of sense for people to take that and make alcohol from. Who the hell thought that Gabe was a good idea? Yeah, what? it's interesting. Uh, and obviously, you know, uh, when we're talking about sugars and agave, I think it's important to point out to our listeners that, you know, as you kind of alluded to, Chava, it's not just like squeezing a grape and you get all this beautiful sugary juice out of there. The starches in agave, correct me if I'm wrong, are called inulin. And they, uh, it, it, it's not good for humans to digest. Like we can't just take in a bunch of inulin raw and then turn it into useful sugar. That's why why uh, I believe I've heard stories of uh, people going to me Mexico and drinking the pulque and uh, having that just be a, a pretty bad situation uh, whoa, once whoa. they digest it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We oh, are man. not. There, we will leave. I, I, I think I can speak for Chava on this. We will leave this podcast if you are going to badmouth pulque. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not badmouthing pulque. I'm just saying that a lot of us gringos don't have the GI uh, microbiome to be able to handle it. No, in... no, it's, no. Can I, I think I can do this one, Chava, but, but flag me if I get something wrong on the science. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm ready. Okay. I'm listening. So the in the inulins that you're talking about are also called fructans in the agave, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so they have to be hydrolyzed in order to become fermentable sugars. Now, you cook the agave and you can do that a bunch of ways. The way we love is cooked underground in this earthen oven. Um, most love. Sorry, Chava. The, <laughs> other, the other way is if you, if you just... As the agave is reaching maturity, you just cut a hole in the in the heart of it, right where the stalk is coming out of it, the quixote, right? You cut that hole in it, and the uh, the agave is like, whoa, what the hell just happened? And it starts producing all these enzymes, and the enzymes will then hydrolyze all of those fructans and turn them into fermentable sugars. So in fact, pulque, that's how you make pulque, is with those sugars that have been hydrolyzed using the enzymes of the agave. Yeah. It's more okay. it's closer to Lambanog. I don't know if you're familiar with the Filipino. <laughs> it, 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 it's a Filipino spirit, actually. Uh, so I, I like, love that. You're you're simplifying by making it even further away <laughs> from sorry. something people know. But, but but it's like palm sap. You know, like palm sap. There's a lot of distilled drinks out of palm sap. So technically, pulque is sort of some sap that's just being fermented. So yeah, I, I got gotcha. you. I think what happens though, I call it like the all-inclusive syndrome for gringos. You don't drink one glass of pulque. They drink like a whole pitcher <laughs> and then they blame the spirit. Well, not the spirit, the fermented drink for feeling all crazy. I just want <laughs> I, I, I just want a clarification though, Chava. Have you ever sat down and had a single glass of pulque? I'm not going to disclose that because my parents might listen to this. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad that you guys uh, set me straight on that. Um, but, but you know, but I, I would say the interesting to me, the interesting thing about the agave as the sugar source is there is no other sugar source used to make alcohol that takes as long to reach maturity as the agave, right? Like every other sugar source that you can name that's used to make alcohol is four months, six months, maybe a year. And with agave, like the low end is going to be four years. And, you know, you've got people saying you've got as much as 40 years. And I don't know if that's true, but I know for a fact you've got 20 and 22 year old agaves. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's a it's a crazy experiment in terroir, in my opinion, because, you know, we think of a bad year or a good year with grapes. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, that's not how agave works. You have to sort of uh, take into account all of the climate and you know, microbiota and the the human aspects of the cultivation that go into uh, making that agave over decades. And so I think that's part the part that's both intriguing, but also very difficult to wrap your head around. Uh, and, cool. and in addition, we have these other factors like the different shapes of the stills and, and some of the open fermentation practices that make it even more kind of complex. Uh, so I think this might be a good time, Lou, for you to maybe talk a little bit about that little uh, three by three tasting or four by four <laughs> tasting that we did over at Tales of the Cocktail. So talk a little bit about that kind of chord progression, so to speak, and 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 what you're trying to get across with that. <laughs> wow, chord progression. I like that. Yeah, it, it was a three by three tasting. So it was three flights of three spirits each. And and literally, it's as you suggested it earlier, what I was trying to do was distill, sorry for the pun, distill my years of experience going to Mexico and tasting these spirits uh, into this 90 minute session. So, you know, at the beginning, I was trying to figure out what my agave is, right? This is what a lot of mezcal geese go through. Like, okay, I've, I've had the espadine and now I want to try something else. And am I a tobala person? Am I a, a tepestate person? Mm-hmm. Am I an arqueño person? And so I, I thought maybe arqueño is my agave. And, 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 I, I, and so I went down that path for a long time. So this first flight is literally three spirits made by the same mescalero. In the, using the same tools in the exact same process where the only thing that's different is the agave used so that you can you can get the sense of how a different agave expresses the flavors and the aromas in the finished spirit, right? So that's that's the first flight. And then the second flight was, was my epiphany that, oh, not all araqueños will taste the same. So the second flight is three spirits made uh, using the exact same agave um, made using the exact same tools, exact same place, exact same time within a 60 day period, um, by three different mescaleros. So the, the, very specifically the expressions that I used were from, um, these, these, this extended family, three different mescaleros from this extended family in Santa Maria Ixcatlan. Uh, and they use, uh, Papalome as the, the primary agave in that community. So you and they all use the same same palenque, same distillery to make the spirit. So you get the sense of how important the hand of the maker is when you taste those three spirits side by side. Same agave, same process, same place, same time, different maker, different flavors, right? So that was my opinion. So, oh, okay. So it's really it's the hand of the maker that's so important. And then and then I was at Victor Ramos's Palenque in Miwatlan, and he had, I think it was two years when I tried it, um, two years of his Tobala expressions. And it was shocking to me how different those two expressions were. So then that third flight that I do is about this, this capturing this moment of time, because somebody like Victor Ramos, I, you know, as you were talking about a bad year for grapes, what was going through my head is, I don't think any of these men and women that I've met who make what I would consider fantastic spirits, right? Where, where their palate speaks to my palate. I don't think I've ever met one of them who said, "Ah, I made this one, but the agave was no good. Right. (laughs) Like it was a, it was a bad harvest of agave. I don't think I've ever heard that. Um, so for me, that's demonstrating that these men and women, if they, if they lived somewhere else, And they brought that multi-generational wisdom with them to the USA, to Chicago. I think every single one of them could be outstanding chefs because they figured out how to take these different ingredients through this very long process. And very like, again, you, you don't have any mechanisms helping you. It's all your five senses that are doing it. And you still end up with great tastes, but different tastes each time. Mm hmm. 
So that's yeah, so, that third flight. <laughs> right. So it's kind of like the, the progression is sort of uh, the fingerprint of the agave varietal, then the fingerprint of the maker, and then the fingerprint of the moment in time. And perhaps, you know, perhaps that means yeast, right? Uh, you were talking Ooh. about different things that might have been flowering at, at the time when, when these uh, different batches were being yeah. fermented. Yeah, I like to talk about the 400 decisions. And I use 400 specifically because in I think it's Aztec, but again, Java, stop me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I think it's the and you and I had a debate over yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, I'm, right? I'm not sure which. Uh, I I I can't remember if it's now. But anyway, let's assume it's Aztec. Uh, well, this, yeah. yeah. Okay. So 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 they th when you and I say I've got a million things to do, right? It means we have an a never ending and infinite number of things to do. When the Aztecs said the same thing, they would just say, "Oh man, I got four hundred things to do." So I talk about these four hundred decisions and. So, you know, you're not wrong. Like the yeast is one of those things and it's not really a decision, but when you're using wild yeast and, and you know, you can, you can absolutely make mezcal using a closed fermenter, but the stuff that we love, stuff that we love is all yeah. open air fermented. Um, and, and so you're going to get different yeasts in the batch, inoculating the batch, depending on what is flowering at any given time, you're going to like, you cannot, when you use an earthen oven, you cannot get the exact same temperature every time. You're going to use different wood. When you're milling it, when you're milling it by hand, using a wooden mallet, it's never going to be as finely milled from one batch to the next. There's all these little things that are going to change from one batch to another. And it's it's that palette of the mescalero, of the maestro, that determines the 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 end of that journey. And that to me, like it's it's absolutely a moment in time, but it's a moment in time that even that mescalero could never capture again. Yeah, we see sometimes we see people uh, when talking about whiskey, for example, you know, they, they talk about whiskey as, you know, or like liquid sunshine or something like that, uh, because it's very, very easy to, uh, you know, go back to the field where the corn grew and talk about the rain and the sun and all that stuff. But it, it seems like with agave, it's not just sunshine. There is, <laughs> like you said, the the, uh, the other 399 things that you also have to take into account. So I think it, it makes complete sense to me why you are both so energized and obsessed with this particular type of spirit. Um, and, and I was hoping that we could maybe turn our attention now a little bit more to culture, because I think that's one of the aspects that I just can't possibly describe, having never been to Oaxaca. So Chava, can, can you enlighten our <laughs> listeners as to some of the cultural aspects uh, that go along with agave either production or consumption? Because uh, there's just certain <laughs> things that we we don't and can't know having never been there ourselves. Yeah, I mean, we just had an interview that was amazing about this thing. We interviewed some guys from Sansecan, which they're based in Guerrero. And something that was crazy for us to understand is Sansecan, it's probably the largest cooperative project uh, around the agave spirits in Mexico. And what they were explained to us is they did not start doing agave spirits. They did not start commercializing agave spirits. They started just you know, uh, selling fertilizer, saying like all the basic needs for the town. And turns out agave spirits were part of those basic needs. They were as important as fertilizer for farming as to their culture, their rituals. It's even medicine. Like you have a stomachache and you'll drink a little bit of puntas to stabilize your stomach again. Puntas being the head of the distillation, the really high proof stuff. 74 ABB. They're yeah. delicious, guys. Anyways, <laughs> uh, it's my preferred way, thing to drink in agave spirits world. So it's extremely embedded into culture. And it's so embedded that it's it's maybe not even, I don't know, like I, I, I think as much as I love that Lou and I talk of this, I think if it was like the ultimate gospel, you know, like it's, it's just part of them. And there's a deep appreciation for it, but it's understood as, sort of the social fabric. I think it, that's why I like also to compare it with ceramics because it's all these products that are representation of who they are, of their environment, of their history. So, you know, I think like a big part of our lives is like a lot of the things that we consume are so disattached from us. Like those headphones you guys are wearing were designed by people that were so not close to you. They were fabricating a place that is absolutely foreign to you and you have not real tangible connection to this. I think what difference with agave spirits in Mexico is like all these people probably even know the mountain where that agave was harvested 
and where that clay was taken to make the, the dishes and the cup that they're going to be drinking from. So I think that's a big difference in, in a way that it's so familiar and close to them. You know, I, I think another that's really interesting, the clay to the uh, to the agave spirits comparison. It's, it's, it's interesting to me because it's also representative of how common they are to daily usage. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's just, you know, as you think of waking up in the morning and using toothpaste and that like, you know, when, when you don't have toothpaste in your bathroom in the morning, you have a small panic attack, right? Because you like, you're like, everybody in the office is going to like you, this guy. It's similar experience. All these basic needs that we have that we panic if we don't have, agave spirits is part of that. And, and the long let me even started about the traditional parties. There's this thing called calendas in Oaxaca specifically. So a calenda, it's imagine like the craziest festival, like the Mardi Gras, multiply that by 10 and get higher ABB spirits all around you. That's a calenda. And there's a band that doesn't need electricity. It's just like trombones and and they're just drums. Wo- yeah. drums. They're just walking around the town and they're shooting firecrackers so you can find the party and follow along. So, you know, and, and Mezcal, it's, it's the... You know, part of the fabric that puts all this together or like that that ma- makes the the connection so it's just it's actually really hard you know like even as a mexican I, i'm I, I was born in rural mexico but i grew almost all my life in mexico city so it's not that i can say that i can actually have that specific connection i have a different type of connection but uh but i but i, but I really enjoy seeing that one i really like i think for both lou and i drink agave spirits in rural mexico even if it's the same spirit, it's different than drinking it in America or in any other bar or city bar. That makes complete sense to me. I mean, it, it, one of the things that I'm starting to to notice as both of you talk about agave spirits is the fact that you're very aware of how much you don't know, or to put it a different way, how intangible mm-hmm. some of these aspects of agave spirits are. They're, they're more felt than understood. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. and I think that that's part of the value uh, of your project, Agave Road Trip. So I'd love right now for you guys to kind of explain how Agave Road Trip uh, was invented or conceived <laughs> and, uh, and and why you've decided to, uh, to bring this to the Heritage Radio Network and uh, blast it out uh, across the airwaves. Yeah, you know, so the... the... <sighs> You know, I, I, I want to step back to what uh, Chava was talking about with culture to explain why we're doing Agave Road Trip, right? So to me, the, the biggest differential in culture between these rural Mexican communities that we love, and I'm not saying this is everywhere in Mexico, but the, the communities that we love um, and the world that we live in, both, you know, me here in the USA, but also Chava in Mexico City, um, you know, the world that I live in is all about how can you do things more efficiently? How can I do the exact same thing in less time? And we've got all these tools now to help us do that, right? I mean, even the, even the fact that we're able to do this recording from so far apart, all three of us, right? Like that's technology. And and so how do we do things in a more efficient way becomes a, a, a basis of how we live. And yet in these communities, that's not even a consideration. Like time something, we've done a, an episode on this, time to me feels like it, it's inconsequential in these communities, that the one thing they focus on is how do I get a better result? And obviously there are different definitions of what better is, but over and over and over again, the communities that I find myself most bonded to and most drawn to are the ones that do the opposite of what I do. And it drives me nuts sometimes how long it will take to get something done. But for them, the outcome is more important than the process. And mm. and so that to me is a big piece of what Agave Road Trip is meant to do, is to communicate all of those facets to these gringo bartenders about Agave, Agave Spirits in rural Mexico to help them understand what's going on. Because I think... You know, I think the men and women who work in the bars and restaurants in the USA taste this and they taste a heartbeat. They taste something that they don't taste in any other beverage 
in their bars and their restaurants. And and they don't understand what that is. And I think when you boil it all down, and I guess we could have just had one episode and done this, but I think when you boil it all down is, it is that multi-generational wisdom of looking at things and trying to figure out how to get that best result. And, mm-hmm. and, and I think something, and you know, like, and I think you got nervous saying the word preservation because of this. Because I think that really fascinating thing of what we're doing is we're tracking a lot of changes and a lot of innovation and a lot of these words and feelings that they, people think are just Silicon Valley, you know, exclusive. And I think there's a lot of innovation and craziness and imagination happening in the way this, because, you know, when you see how the son of one of the palenqueros that has been doing that for four years decides to intervene and use his, his or her imagination to come up with a new agave spirit, that it's going to give you another 50 years of richness using the same tools they've been using for 400 years. Mm -hmm. Like you you don't get that anywhere else. Like, yeah, like I I guess in searching like Japanese ceramics or Korean ceramics or there's very specific, very few things in the planet that are done today with those characteristics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things I love about Agave Road Trip is that you you kind of take this approach where you're you're you select one aspect of agave spirits or agave culture or agave distillation Mm -hmm. techniques and you kind of focus on that one aspect in each episode now very different than the types of episodes that we do here at modern bar car but what i like about it is that i can sit there and listen to an episode of agave road trip for you know 10 15 20 minutes however long it takes and then once I've once once you've explained that one slice of the pie to me, I can kind of sit there and think about it a little while because I find, as you've said with agave spirits, that I do actually need to sit there and chew on it and digest it a little bit before I can really understand it in an intuitive way that doesn't require me to then go back to your episode and re-listen to it, if that makes sense. Yeah, we're, we're sort of hydrolyzing the information for you so that it's digestible. Oh, Shavo, we can use that somewhere. Don't no, we forget no, we're that. we're not using that. We're not using that, Lou. No. That, that, I mean, the other thing is we do make a lot of jokes, right? Because we're sounding all nerdy today. I don't know what, what happened to us. Maybe it's the coffee we had today. But we're usually very... <laughs> You know, more informal about the the way we discuss well, this thing. We're, we have to we have to be informal because we have like twelve minutes for our episodes, Java. That, that is we don't have to, right. Yeah, but, but yeah. we do a lot of research though, and and I think that <laughs> he does a lot of research. Well, I I try to do a lot of research, and, and that's something that we also try to mix. You know, it's like yes, have like the fun stories of real Mexico, of how Lou almost gets killed in a blockade and stuff like that, but also <laughs> talk about the surfactants and uh, combustion <laughs> systems and all that. You know, like but like, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully in a way that people will understand it is the key and enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so what's the overall, what's the plan for Agave Road Tripper? You d- you're doing kind of like a seasonal approach, just kind of give our listeners the elevator pitch as if you were trying to steal them from me and, and take them for yourself. <laughs> we don't have to steal them. We can share them. This is a, We're living in a sharing world now, Eric. We can share them. So I, 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 th- I think the plan was, I don't know. Do we have a, do we have a plan? Well, Java? Well- I was only traveling with you because you need a translator. So whatever plan, <laughs> whatever plan we're making, I'm sure it's not going to fly the way we're thinking about it. You know, I, I thought it was an opportunity to communicate stuff. The podcast was an opportunity to communicate things uh, that I was trying to communicate during my tastings in a way that existed beyond the 90 minutes that I was live with someone. And, and so, yeah, Chava's not wrong. I thought, okay, Chava, come with, translate. But Chava and I have been friends for years. And... Honestly, finding the excuse to travel with him was a big piece of the podcast. And then once we started having these interactions, it just, it, I mean, it's, there, there's a backstory that we're not going to get into, but it fell, it fell together over two days in Chicago in February, where we'd been working for over a year, year and a half um, on the interviews. And we just started recording the episodes. Our friend Jason Saldana, who's at PRX, said, don't make any episode more than 12 minutes. And so we, we, you know, we had that as our frame. We had all these hour-long interviews. 
and we just started pulling quotes from them. Um, my friends at Heritage Radio Network have been great from the start. So, uh, you know, I knew that they were reaching a lot of the people we wanted to reach. And and so we just we did these eight basic episodes. But man, once we got locked down, I, did you call me, Chava, or did I call you? I can't remember. We've been recording like crazy. We've we've done up to like maybe five episodes a day because we have dozens <laughs> of interviews that we had done in these crazy trips, and we like have the time to actually listen to them, and we're finding gold left and right. So, so if it's fool's gold, to be fair, but gold, <laughs> nonetheless. So I think we both really want to travel uh, more. We have yeah. plenty of interviews and we're doing a new season based on these interviews of our past travels. Uh, but now we have, we want to do a pulque trip. We want to do a whole, <laughs> whole pulque series because we went to uh, Tinacal, which is the equivalent of the Palenque of a distillery. We'll have like a fermenting house. Uh, in second terms, the, where the Toji works <laughs> is that a permission <laughs> house for Pulke. And, uh, and we just were, were blown away. So, and we happen to be a Gabby road trip, not a Gabby spirits road trip. So we have the license to go for fermented trip. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I, I think what you're going to see, Eric, is that I, I think what we're targeting is the, is it the first weekend in September where we're going to start launching season two as a weekly podcast. 15 minute episodes max including all the the intro theme song commercial stuff like that right right well that's great uh so we'll definitely have links uh to agave road trip over on the show notes page for this episode at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast and of course just like you found this podcast you can find agave road trip on your favorite podcasting app so i definitely encourage folks to do that i've enjoyed listening uh to the episodes that i've that i've been able to get through so far and uh, i'm excited for more to come uh, and speaking of more to come what i'd love to talk about now is uh before we get into the lightning round i'd like to talk about where agave spirits are headed and this is a tricky thing to talk about uh and and i'm part of this 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 is a bit of a trap lou i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna warn you outright <laughs> that this is a bit of a trap because after your am seminar, i gonna end up gnawing my leg off is that what you're telling me maybe you you may end up gnawing your leg a little you, you'll be tempted we'll put it that way you'll at least be tempted to gnaw your leg off sure but uh part of the trap is that i've had a year to think about uh your seminar and uh, i've had a lot of time to mull it over and w i'll start i'll start off by saying that i was very torn during your seminar because during parts of it it seemed like you were going hard in the paint about the individual genius of some of these mescaleros, some of these maestros. Uh, uh, I believe it was Lalo who who found this way to galvanize the citizens of his of his town and uh, create a cistern so that he would be able to save the young men in this area from having to go other places to find work because there was no water for farming, for example. So yeah. th that's, that, that's one story that really stuck with me and it was about individual genius. And then there were these other moments when you're talking about agave culture in general, where you were like very Zen about it. You were like, very like, <laughs> but I guess it's a good thing that maybe all of these big uh, companies are co-opting these words like Tahona because that gets it out there. Uh, gets it out in the in the consciousness of American consumers, and if we can con can teach American consumers what a Tahona is, then I guess it's a good thing, right? Yeah. And so when I stepped all the way back, what struck me was that I couldn't find a clear chord between. Um, Oh, and now now I'm struggling to remember the philosophic. Uh, basically, the, the, the trolley it's the tr it's the classic trolley problem, right? Do you yeah. pull the lever and kill yeah. one person, or do you allow the trolley to mow down five people by not intervening, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so are you like, how do you think of of where agave is headed, and and our role as I guess educators and communicators in that space? Yeah, yeah, yeah. boy, there's a lot in there. Okay, so I know, I know. <laughs> you know Start I, gnawing that leg. You know, I think, <laughs> wish I had shaved this morning. So I think um, that it's important to first point out that my belief is I don't think having 
an industrial product precludes having a beautiful handmade product, right? I don't think that you can't have, for instance, like a Coors and a Southern Tier Brewing uh, coexisting. Obviously, you can. Um, I believe that the direction that Mescal is Mescal specifically is going to go is there will be more industrialization. And I think there has to be more industrialization just to meet the demand, the consumer demand that continues to blow up. You know, I just this morning I was preparing our our uh, Instagram post for Agave Road Trip. And it's it's very much about how since 2005, I've been reading the same article about Mescal, that it's having a moment. Right. And it will continue to have a moment because people keep discovering it. And in order to fill the demand of those people discovering it, you need to be able to make more. And you, and, and you have to introduce some level of efficiency in order to meet that demand. Or you just tell people they can't have it and it's only for really wealthy people, at which point you actually undermine the ability of some of these communities to continue to have this thing that is in their lives on a daily basis. And and then this another curveball in all of this is that word mezcal is owned now by the Mexican government. They decide what gets to be called mezcal and what doesn't. And so a lot of these families who have been making these agave spirits in a heritage way for multiple generations, for hundreds of years, the vast majority of them are not allowed to legally use that word. So, you know, I think. I think you're going to start seeing agave spirits used more frequently because it has to encompass not just mezcal and tequila, but also ricea and bacanora and then all of these uncertified agave spirits, destilado de agave. So you're going to see that phrase being used more often. You're going to see more industrialization of things that are certified mezcal, but then you're also going to see industrialization outside of mezcal in agave spirits because there's going to be corporations seeing that there's an opportunity to make money in that field. The key is, through all of this, the key is we need to, we need to, here again, like it feels arrogant to say it, but I think it is in my best interest and I think in the best interest of the human species to ensure that these families who have been doing this thing the same way for multiple generations by hand who have said, I don't want to be industrial. I don't want efficiency. I want the best result. I think it is in our best interest to ensure that they can survive. And it becomes harder and harder and harder for them to survive when you've got these large corporations coming in and buying up the agave. Because without the agave, they can't keep doing what they're doing. And if I'm, if I'm a... If I'm a multinational liquor company and I've just dropped a hundred million dollars buying a mezcal brand, I am then going to drop another hundred million dollars protecting that investment by buying up the exact same farms where these families had been purchasing their agave. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Chava, what do you think? I think there's also, I, I know this sounds like it's either one or the other, right? Either super artisanal or industrial, but I think like what I was trying to do with Sombra or what we were just trying to do in Sombra was the medium place. And what we're trying to do is what will happen if a lot of the new technology gets inspired by the old technology. And you just don't go and try to buy the same steam equipment that has been used to do vodka, rum, and blah, 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 which is going to, I mean, uh, like maybe produce a really boring generic product that it's erasing a lot of the heritage. Like, is there any chance in that high tech can get inspired by that really complex systems that traditional spirits used to be produced? And the thing is, the reason why most people or most companies don't do that is, is because it's extremely complicated. You need a lot of mm-hmm. money. You need to redevelop all these technologies, readjust them, create a whole breed of new engineers that are going to understand this equipment and are going to like the idea of using this equipment. And so I think there's a marvelous opportunity there to reestablish what a, an industrial product is. Yeah. I just, I just, I, you know, I, I think you're right. There's an opportunity, but in essence, the opportunity is, hey, let's go make a more expensive wheel. And, and, and I love that more expensive wheel, not as much as I love the thing that isn't even a wheel, but what 
corporations are going to say, yeah, I'm like the fact that John did that amazes me. And I love Sombra. For yeah, doing yeah. That. They're, they're crazy. Yeah. They're, they're the only ones that did that. I mean, yeah, they're, 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 yeah. there was, and I wish like, this sounds good, right? This sounds like a good sales pitch in a way. It's like get inspired by the old technologies, create new technologies and come up with beautiful products. Not a lot of people are buying this idea. I, I mean, I, <laughs> uh, I'll say there's only one group of people that has, has that I know that has bought this idea. So yeah. where are they going? I don't know. Like, I, I think Lou has an accurate way of explaining this. Uh, what I want them to go is to get more diversity. What I will like, and again, like this, I guess what I was trying to say when I was saying about Tonayan and Cuervo and all that when I was a kid, I think what was great about Mezcal is that it started to get strong because there was a need for diversity. People, all of us were starting to get bored. And in my self-interest of, uh, of my palate and my, and my knowledge and the, and the things that I want to be trying in the next 25 years, I just really hope keeps on becoming more diverse and let's not flatten that curve right like we want right. that curve to go up in diversity so that's where i wish it will go is that where it's going i don't know i think we'll all have to work really hard for that to happen right right and uh just to just to put a, a finer point on what i was saying earlier the two words that i was struggling to uh to come up with were utilitarianism and virtue ethics which are these two ways of thinking about how to do good things yeah. Right? Utilitarianism is the most good for the most people. That's when you pull the lever on the trolley and you kill one person but save five people. But virtue ethics is a little bit different in that it's it's a bit squishier. And uh, you know when you when you study virtue ethics, the philosophy of virtue ethics, it's really the philosophy of flourishing. And so I think Lou, one of the things that I was struggling with when you told that story about Lalo was I was like, well, goddamn, Lalo is a utilitarianism. <laughs> like he's a utilitarian and and he by creating this cistern created the most good for the most people right yep. he's basically saved the, the the water uh resources for this entire town and and there were ripple effects in the availability of of laborers as a result so that's like a very utilitarian thing well i don't want the laborers to go away maybe i should do this thing that prevents that okay mm -hmm. mission accomplished and yet now we're sitting in this seminar room in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I'm drinking these beautiful, beautiful spirits and listening to your stories, and I feel like I'm I'm flourishing as a result. And and there was there's so there's definitely some flourishing that comes out of that. So yeah. I, I think, you know, that that sort of tension between like, what is this? Is it this or is it this? Is is very sort of indicative of agave. Agave <laughs> you can't compare it to other spirits and, and some of the problems in the agave world, which are also in certain ways opportunities. Um, also, just you really can't compare them to other dilemmas in other spirits spaces. Uh, and so I think that's that's one of the things that that made me so excited to talk to you guys because I've been literally thinking about this this issue between <laughs> utilitarianism and virtue ethics for the past year <laughs> since I've listened to you. And I don't think there's a solution, but I think having conversations like this at least makes the problems more interesting. <laughs> you, you, yeah, do you, you want me to make the, the what's going through your head a bit more complex? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay, so I then asked Lalo if he would help me design the same kind of water systems, water collection systems in other communities. And he said, no, he won't. They need to do it on their own. Yeah. And it took me a long time to figure out, and I figured out the hard way what he meant. It's not like he's... It's not like he's opposed to them doing what he's doing, but his point was, I believe, that they need to be motivated enough to figure it out for themselves. You can't do it for them because that doesn't make them better. Absolutely. Which, mm -hmm. you know, again, like, okay, so are you doing the most good for them? Like, it's so complex. It's so hard. It's so hard. And, I, and, and to your point, I find myself learning every single time I go down there and growing, and I don't think there is a final answer. I think I just keep searching for that answer in a sort of Nietzschean cycle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, gentlemen, this has been tremendous. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed uh, just dropping that bomb on you and and because uh, it's been sitting on my shoulders for the past year. Uh, so so uh, nice. that's check that off my bucket list. Uh, I'm happy. Uh, anything else you want to uh, communicate before we jump into the lightning round? I got nothing. Java. 
I'm, I'm happy. Let's go to the lightning round. Okay, I'll Let's blind my. I, I got my blindfold on. Go. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll start with Chava. Chava, um, we actually emailed a little bit <laughs> about this. Um, you are more of a straight spirits guy than a cocktail guy, so I will ask you, um, what is a agave spirit that you've had in the past year or so that really blow your mind, and and why did it blow your mind? I'll say that Tepemete, uh, it's a special, actually, I don't know the scientific uh, Tepemete name. Do you know, Lou? What spe- <laughs> uh, he doesn't care about that. Anyways, that, <laughs> anyway, the Tepemete, could, that could be some variation of Durangensis, maybe, uh, that we found in, in, in Durango. Uh, it's just insane. It's just like, it's, it's just fruity in, in a, and such high ABB, it's 55 ABB. And you just feel like you're drinking a cocktail. Like if a cocktail was a neat spirit, it'll be a tepemete. That, that's my assessment of the tepemete. And it's just really, really delicious and, and pretty. Extremely expensive, unfortunately, because it's a small one. It takes a long time to grow. Not very efficient, but uh, I love it. Beautiful. <laughs> Lou, uh, you know what? We'll skip cocktails. Same question. What's an agave spirit that you've had uh, in the last year or so that is really blowing your mind? Oh, God. You know, it's funny. I don't even think of them that way. I really don't. And, you know, for me, the, the best spirit is the one that I'm drinking right now, you know? Mm-hmm. But, oh, but you know what? But here's what I do want to talk about is uh, uh, Aquilino, Maestro Aquilino, um, just died recently. Uh, he, um, mm-hmm. yeah, he's, he's, he, he was one of the uh, foundational mescaleros for Vago, Mescal Vago. And ev- I, I always thought I would get to meet this guy. I always thought I would have an opportunity, and I always put it off because he's so far away from Centro. So I never went to meet him, and then he 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 died um, unexpectedly in an accident uh, a few weeks ago. But I wanted to meet him because every single time I tasted one of his assam- ensembles, which is when you make a, a mezcal using more than one agave. So you roast them together, you mill them together, you ferment them together, you distill them together. He used to do some of the most amazing ensembles I ever tasted. And he, he used uh, Sierra Negra and Tepestate in one. And that like, I had it years ago, but it's still, it still speaks to my palate. Uh, when I think of like favorite things I've ever had. Yeah. Mm. That's a beautiful answer, and yeah, uh, big big loss to the industry. Obviously, when Aquilina passed, but um, but yeah, that's uh, and and I, I I love the ensemble, but that's just yet another uh, added layer of complexity in the agave spirits world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Next question. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll have this one re- reserved for Lou. Uh, Lou, if you were a cocktail ingredient, what would you be and why? <laughs> so so I. Don't think I could, like, my wife would say that I I would be bitters, but, you know, that's an obvious joke. You know, I think if I were uh, anything having to do with the the cocktail, it would be the vessel that it is served in. You know, for me, that's so much of the experience, um, and in particular, when you're drinking these neat spirits, these neat agave spirits, that really any spirit that's high ABV, like, I, I hate these tiny little shot glasses, and I hate snifters. I want something that's wide open, uh, like a cereal bowl, like these jicaras uh, that are used in rural Mexico to drink out of. Um, because the, the, when when you put the high ABV spirit into that vessel, instead of it all focusing the um, uh, the evaporation, blowing out into your face, you get this, this like, cannonball of aromas uh, in, in your nose. You, you get this in, in that wide open vessel. It just starts wafting around you and pulls your head in. I want to be that. I want to be the mm-hmm. thing that pulls you into the spirit instead of blowing you away from the spirit. It's like walking totally. into a cave. <laughs> uh, Chava, so instead of a cocktail ingredient, if you were a tool as a part <laughs> of... You're a tool, the agave- Chava. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if you were a tool involved in the making of an agave spirit, what tool would you be and why? Of course, the combustion system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got, I, I'll be the fire. I'll be the fire in every part of the process. I'll be the fire in the tapada and I'll be the fire in the distillation. And yeah, like I, I wouldn't be a wood fire. I'll be like a costume made combustion system that it's uh trying to make imitate what wood does without using wood that, that'd Amazing. be i'd be a grease fire where you 
<laughs> oh man. Oh man. Okay. Next question. Uh, if you could have a drink, could be a cocktail, could be a copita of your favorite mezcal with, uh, anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just kind of paint us a picture, Lou. Oh God. You know, I mean, this is going to sound corny, but it is a hundred percent accurate. And from the heart, like it would be with Chava, this lockdown, <laughs> I, you know, I didn't realize how much of a social person I am and, and being locked away from the people I, you know, I, I, I want to see has been really hard. I want to get into a car with, with some pulque and with Chava First the pulque gets in, then Chava gets in. <laughs> and I want to drive through rural Mexico and I want to visit some men and women that we already know and love and meet some new men and women. I want to I want to get on an agave road trip. It's so frustrating. You know, at the beginning you had talked about it's only been a year since that seminar that we had, right? Mm -hmm. Well, like time during this um, this pandemic has sort of the same exchange rate as the dollar to the peso, right? Every <laughs> month is 20 months, and it feels like it has been 10 years since I've been down there. Yeah, it is uh, it is oppressive, um, but I, I, that's a great answer. Chava, how about you? I cannot say that it's not blue now. If I say, <laughs> if I, if I, if I say anybody else, I'm going to look like a terrible person. But I will say I would love to have a drink with the cop that stopped us on our way back to Mexico and asked Lou, have you drank pulque? And Lou shouted, si, yes. And he thought the cop was asking him if he liked pulque, but the cop was just trying to know if he was drunk and driving. And Lou was very, very happy saying yes. Si, pulque, fantastico. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh what is a common or traditional cocktail ingredient or we could also go with maybe a, a spirit uh that you've never tasted and why chava uh, so you have a whole episode of baijiu and i lived uh -huh. in china for a bit and i realized that i did not understand the different categories of baijiu so i i'm sure i haven't tried like half those categories i would love to try all the baijiu categories that are out there what yeah, the hell's a baijiu? It's it's a traditional uh, Chinese spirit, and uh, you know I, I recently had this interview with Derek Sandhouse, uh, who is responsible for Ming River Baijiu, which is he's it's the oldest I believe distillery in the Sichuan province of China. It's Ooh. been operating since Shakespeare was like nine years old. <laughs> uh, I, I did that math. Uh, it was kind of crazy. And uh, the, the cool thing is, you know, it's another one of those Koji episodes where where we talked about it. they literally get alcohol out of a solid mash. So like when we it was one of those mind blowing experiences where I had to think about a distillation process where there's no distiller's beer or no distiller's wine involved. So that kind of blew my freaking mind just all up and down the road. Um, so yeah, that's in, in a word, Baijiu is a traditional Chinese spirit, but it's got, it almost has the same type of variety that agave spirits have, which is why I found myself mm. having so many like parallels between these two types of spirits. So we need to do a road trip in China, Lou. I'll do the driving though. <laughs> 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 done and done. Awesome. Uh, Lou, what about you? Anything that you've never tasted and why? You know, I, oh God, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I haven't tasted the vast majority of uh, cocktail ingredients, but you know, I do, I want <sighs> I want to give a shout out to the mercados in, in rural Mexico, like the little markets in rural Mexico, where you can find these incredible ingredients that should be used for cocktails, right? Like yeah. there's 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 all these fruits that you'll never see anywhere. And there's a whole line of them that are called zapotes. And I've become obsessed with all of the zapotes, but in particular, <laughs> yeah, 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 you know where I'm going, Chava. Yeah, yeah. In particular, zapote amarillo, the yellow zapote, which looks sort of like mango, but inside it's dense. It look like it, it's dense like egg yolk, and it's even called egg fruit. Um, and it's delicious, and it's so hard to find. And I convinced, I convinced Chava to, to look for it for months. Finally found someone who had it, and then I convinced him. He met me in um, in Durango back in January, which was only like six years ago. Yeah. Met me uh, in Durango, and he he had 
put them into um, a 5% brine solution so that they would start fermenting so I could bring them back because you can't bring like a whole fruit back to the U.S. from Mexico. So it, like I had these two beautiful bottles of fermenting uh, Zapote Amarillo, one of which uh, the the guys at customs opened because they were afraid of what it might be, but it was mid fermentation, so I know it blew up on them, <laughs> and they were covered in this sapote amarillo. Was, yeah, oh, that's incredible. <laughs> that's incredible. Uh, all right, Lou, you uh, you warned me about this one, so I'm gonna let you take the first swing at it. You said that this could take up the entire interview. So, what is a <laughs> unusual or controversial view that you hold in the spirits or cocktail world? I believe that you should be able to make mezcal in the USA or in India or South Africa, Australia, name it. Same as you can make whiskey, and I know this is never going to happen, but same as you can make whiskey anywhere, not just in Ireland. Um, I think I think mezcal should be the name of the category, and it can't be now because it's, it's owned by Mexico and they decide this is and this is not mezcal. And, and, you know, some people think that my view of that is I'm trying to take something away from from Mexico. But in fact, my belief is if you can make it in the USA, in India, in South Africa, and call it mezcal, that all of these families in rural Mexico who either because they don't have the financial means or because they are geographically undesirable, according to the the, the CRM, they could then use that word as well. Mm, yeah. And Chava, you and I actually went back and forth a little bit before this interview about the idea of agave spirits uh, being made in places that are not Mexico. What are your thoughts on that? I actually love the idea just because I want to try more things. Probably it's an absolutely selfish uh, perception, but I will really love to try an agave that's growing in the desert of Nevada or that it's growing in Arizona or in South Africa. Like I cannot imagine the type of flavors that are attached to these agaves that have been living through a lot of stress for 10 years around there. So I'm, I'm, I'm there with, and I think it's also, you know, it's a thing for our times. I think we've all become less nationalistic through all this coronavirus process. If something, I think that things should travel more, you know, uh, we have this mm -hmm. joke in Mexico, what's the best taco, el taco campechano. Which is, which is the best taco, the one, the mixed taco that was that has chorizo and all of the other things in one taco. So it's like more is more. Whoever says, you know, like <laughs> something could, could be just like framed in a golden frame and stayed like the Mona Lisa. I mean, I understand it for, for the Louvre, but this is spirit. <laughs> <laughs> this is something we drink and it's amazing that it evolves. And I want it to keep evolving. So I think one of the big ways that it can evolve if is if it can be produced in other geographical areas. So yes. Totally. And I love that you just somehow incorporated tacos and the Mona Lisa in the same mixed <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> So uh, my, my pitch to our listeners is uh, if, if you enjoy tacos, the Mona Lisa or fermented bottles that explode on uh, TSA employees, then uh, I would encourage you to uh, listen to Agave Road Trip. Uh, hit that subscribe button. It's a really beautiful little series, uh, whether you are completely new to agave spirits or if, like me, you've been able to dip your toe in and uh, you want to go back for, for a little bit more of that goodness. Uh, so please do uh, check out Agave Road Trip. Uh, Lou and Chuck. Chava, how can people connect with you in the digital space? We have an well, Instagram. There's... there's a Facebook because we have an older member in staff. So our, hey. Facebook, very, <laughs> <laughs> our Facebook is very, very active. Uh, Instagram, web page. Our web page is a great resource because a lot of the things, you know, a lot of things we're talking about, you've never seen. So we try to put all these weird names that you heard while we're talking. There's pictures of that, that it's uh, the collection of images that we've done after many years of traveling to Mexico. Which other ways, Lou? You're the digital uh, they, mastermind behind us. They can just call us. We're, we're happy to take their phone calls if they want to connect to us. That's still digital, right? Because I've got a digital phone. Does that count? <laughs> Ethernet cable's really reliable. I'd say Ethernet cable's a good way to connect to us. Mm -hmm. Totally. Do you have yeah. a fax, a fax number that you want to drop in? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I did. Oh, uh, and, and, and you can become an official genuine certified road tripper. Yes. How, how do we do that? Well, you, you go to uh, Heritage Radio Network, our beloved hosts, you go to their website and uh, there's a little donate button. You click on donate, you choose 
individual member. It's sixty dollars for a year, and then you you designate Agave Road Trip as your like designee, whatever that's called, and then you become an official road tripper, which means when you can finally return to Mexico City. You get to have a bat meme flask of a of a blue Weber agave spirit that was made in Jalisco, but it's not tequila and it's not mezcal and it's not ricea. It's just bat meme. Wow. <laughs> and then we'll also get you a little pin and a membership card. Holy cow. Wow. I know. Uh, right. <laughs> I I now I think we need to figure out how to do some cool stuff like that here at Modern Bar Cart. But uh, while <laughs> I'm figuring that all out, uh, yeah, definitely become an official Agave Road Tripper. The Heritage Radio Network is obviously responsible for some great food and drink podcasts. So you know, once you're once you've uh, listened through all of the episodes of Agave Road Trip, maybe head on over to the Speakeasy or, or one of the other great shows like Cooking Issues. Uh, those are all part of my weekly listening diet. So um, Lou and Chava, I just want to say thank you so much for oh, being thank, on the podcast thank well, you for well, having well, us greatly appreciate it eric yeah yeah it's lovely to talk with people that are as excited about this as we are you know because our friends and family are sick of us so it's always, <laughs> <laughs> it's always nice to have other people into the mix <laughs> uh, cheers gentlemen <laughs> cheers Adios, hasta bro. pronto Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, Agave Insights courtesy of Lou Bank and Chava Peribon of Agave Road Trip, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2020.